Our first scripture reading today is from John chapter 4, verses 45 through 54, and can be found on page 90 in the New Testament in the Pew Bible, if you'd like to follow along. Jesus heals an official's son. Then he came again to Cana in Galilee, where he had changed the water into wine. Now there was a royal official whose son lay ill in Capernaum. When he heard that Jesus had come from Judea to Galilee, he went and begged him to come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. Then Jesus said to him, unless you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. The official said to him, sir, come down before my little boy dies. Jesus said to him, go, your son will live. The man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him and started on his way. As he was going down, his slaves met him and told him that his child was alive. So he asked them the hour when he began to recover. And they said to him, yesterday at one in the afternoon, the fever left him. The father realized that this was the hour when Jesus had said to him, your son will live. So he himself believed along with his whole household Now this was the second sign that Jesus did after coming from Judea to Galilee. Holy words for God's people. Jen. This morning I'll divide my sermon into two parts. Let us begin with this passage Jen read from John chapter 4. And after our anthem and another scripture reading, we'll finish our time with a second healing story one found in the first nine verses of John chapter five. This is the second miracle found in the Gospel of John, and there are many similarities between this passage and another story that can be found in Matthew chapter eight and Luke chapter seven. The stories are similar. An official or father is pleading with Jesus to heal his son or servant. In all three Gospels, Jesus heals the person without ever seeing him. And in all three healing narratives, the sick boy is located in the city of Capernaum. The royal official asks Jesus to heal his son, and he finds Jesus in the town of Cana. But the official's son is located in Capernaum. The distance between these two cities of Cana and Capernaum is about 25 miles, meaning it would take a full day's journey to find Jesus. And the official begged Jesus to save his son's life. The official asked for a miracle. Now, was this Jesus? Was Jesus the first healer that the official had approached? We have no idea how long his son had been sick, but we know that he is in desperate need. And Jesus responded, unless you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. What good is asking people to believe unless we show them our faith in action? There are times when our work as the church helps to address the needs of those who are in pain and those who are in need. And sometimes our service reminds others why faith and belief matter. On some of our best days as a church, we can intermingle the two. While I was in seminary, I served at Princeton United Methodist Church. When I told people where I was working, they asked, is that the big stone building? You see, the sanctuary was built in 1910 and the style mimicked the university directly across the street. The first church I served after seminary is Faith United Methodist Church in Issaquah. When I told people where I was working, they asked, isn't that the church across from Tower Farms? It was true. The church was across the street from a very large piece of real estate known as Tower Farms. Ask any local, they'd know it. However, I've heard about another church This one's located in Cuna, Idaho, where people ask about the church by saying this, isn't that the church that feeds people? When the pastor of Cuna United Methodist Church hears this, she responds, that's right, we feed people, body, mind, and spirit. Pastor Karen also likes to say, feeding people is not what we do. The church that feeds people is who we are. When you tell our neighbors that you're involved at Bothell United Methodist Church, what do they ask? How do people know who we are? 
Sure. We are the church that's across the street from the high school. That is where we're located. But who are we? And Jesus responded, unless you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. I do not think that Jesus was being critical of the royal official. I think that Jesus was aware in this moment that the good news was in eternal things like faith and belief, but also in temporary joys like the healing of someone who is loved. Our second reading today is from John chapter 5, verses 1 through 9, and can be found on page 90 in the New Testament in the New Pew Bible. Jesus heals on the Sabbath. After this, there was a festival of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now in Jerusalem, by the Sheep Gate, there is a pool called in Hebrew Beth Zatha, which has five porticos. In these lay many invalids, blind, lame, and paralyzed. One man was there who had been ill for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had been there a long time, he said to him, Do you want to be made well? The sick man answered him, Sir, I have no one to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. And while I am making my way, someone else steps down ahead of me. Jesus said to him, 
Stand up, take your mat, and walk. At once the man was made well, and he took up his mat and began to walk. Now that day was a Sabbath. Holy words for God's people. Thank you, Jen. In the first healing story, the royal official found Jesus. He heard something about Jesus that gave him hope, and in desperation, he sought him out. In this next passage, Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem and arrives next to the pool of Bethesda. N.T. Wright noted that this pool was a well-known place of healing. Archaeologists have excavated this area, and a person can travel to this historic landmark even today. Wright tells us, the way the pool seems to have worked must have been like this. The waters in the pool would bubble up periodically. When that happened, the first person to get in would be healed. Some people reckoned that the bubbling water was caused by an angel. Now, one man in particular had been trying to get into this pool, but people kept cutting in front of him. So the man had been there for 38 years. I wonder what the prayer of a man would sound like after 38 years. So Jesus arrives and asks this man, do you want to be made well? And the sick man answered him, sir, I have no one to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up, and while I'm making my way, someone else steps down ahead of me. So the sick man does not directly answer yes. He says, I've been trying to get better. I've been working at this for nearly as long as the Jewish people had wandered in the desert. Instead of giving up, here I am. And Jesus said to him, take, stand up, take your mat, and walk. I love serving here at Bothell United Methodist Church. If you spend any time with me, I hope that you know that I have a deep love for the United Methodist Church as a whole. But the truth is, is that what I love about the United Methodist Church, what I love about Bothell United Methodist Church has very little to do with the way that we currently are. Of course, we have great moments when we are living out our calling and our purpose because of great programs like Imagine No Malaria, in the last several years, we as a Methodist church have reduced the number of malaria-related deaths on the continent of Africa from one every 30 seconds to one every 60 seconds. Our church family also has great moments. For example, we provide a meal for all people on Sunday nights at 5 p.m. We host three Narcotics Anonymous groups every week and we have a new focus ministry for individuals with special needs, and that program is growing. There is a genuine sense of excitement and growth happening at every corner of our church. But are we still known as a church that is across the street from the high school? I cannot imagine the life of a man who was by the pool for 38 years. What could possibly have given him the patience and the stubbornness to wait? Even after person after person would cut in front of him, year after year he waited. He waited because he knew that all the pain, all the struggle was worth it. As long as there was hope. As long as he had a chance at being the person that he knew he could be. He knew that there was so much more to life than the cards he was currently dealt. There are some pretty great things happening here at Bothell UMC. Now is not the time for us to look around and say that there are enough people here at church. Now is not the time to assume that because people are coming, that things will always be this way. I love the church today because I see glimpses of the church that we can become, of the church that we can strive to be every day for the sake of our neighbors and those who never walk through our doors. Since we met last week, we have celebrated in memorial the lives of four people connected to our church family. Our bishop and most of his cabinet presided over Reverend Dan Smith's service here a week ago. On Valentine's evening, we had a service for a man who left his young family with four children far too early. Yesterday, we celebrated the lives of one of our parishioners whose parents had died all within the span of one month. 
During that gathering, his core group gathered around him to grieve together, to pray with their family, to cook a large meal together as they held each other in loving support. This is a glimpse of the church the way we are meant to be. People who are serving, people who are mourning, people who are celebrating, people who pull together when we are in our time of need. This, my friends, is church. May we seek to be the church in our very best of ways. A church that says to any and to all people that regardless of your race, regardless of your economic status, regardless of your drug history, regardless of your alcohol history, regardless of your physical or mental challenges, regardless of your sexuality, regardless of the size of the chip on your shoulder, regardless as if you come as a family, as a group of friends, or week after week you sit alone by yourself. May we be the church that hungers to be and to do more because we serve the sacred one who can heal from long distances and the sacred one who can heal right up close. May we love and appreciate the church for where we are here and now, but strive to be the church that we are called to be. May it begin now. May it begin in me. May it begin in us. Amen. Holy and gracious God, there are so many wonderful things happening in our church. And yet in this time, may we hunger to be the church you call us to be. May we be more than just about metrics and numbers, God, but may we seek to bring your kingdom here on earth in a way that is real and relevant. Lord, our ritual and our tradition has brought us thus far, and it is good. It is a strong history of being a faithful church in this community, Lord, in the many communities that we serve. May you instill in each one of us, God, a deep hunger that goes far beyond allegiance, but into becoming the hands and feet that you call us to be. With the many gifts that you have blessed us with as a church, as individuals, and as a community, may we seek to be your people not because of who we are as both of UMC, but because what you have already done in our lives, because of the grace that you've already given us. May our lives be a response to your love. May our words and our mouths and our reactions, may all that we be and do hunger after all that you are and have already done. This we ask in your son's name, Jesus the Christ, because you are alive and well and you call us to be so. Amen.